will sing together the words of the hymn 443, the third hymn on the list for this evening. 443, be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side, bear patiently the cross of grief our pain. So 443, and we'll remain seated. We'll sing all three verses as we remain seated. Please, 443.
294. Sorry, 294. Oh, teach me what it meaneth that cross uplifted high with one the man of sorrows condemned to bleed and die. 294 on the page 295. And we will stand together this time as we sing these words.
great work of our Lord Jesus Christ upon Calvary's cross. And thank thee that it is on the basis of all that he has done for us that we draw nigh to thee this evening. Well, Lord, we thank thee that Christ is our plea. Thank you, Lord, for the acceptance that we have before the throne of God. Oh, Lord, we thank thee that we are able to draw nigh on all the grounds of Christ's finished work. Oh Lord, we thank Thee that Thy Word reveals to us the great value of the human soul. And as we were reminded this morning, the creation of man was that which was distinct from every other part of creation while into the creatures was breath. Man became a living soul. Soul of man that never ceases to exist. Lord, as we think that truth, we are reminded of the very issue of priority. Even now as we meet in God's house, are those that are consumed with thoughts of how their bodily needs are going to be provided over these next days. And we are reminded afresh that it is so easy to have a distorted set of priorities. We pray this evening that as we meet here, that our hearts and minds will be calmed presence of the Lord. And oh Lord, we pray that our focus will indeed be upon that which is spiritual and eternal. Oh Lord, we pray to thee that in the midst of all of the confusion that prevails around us, that we will know that peace in our blessed Lord. We do cry to thee, even at this time when so many are filled with fears. We cry to thee that the hearts of men and women will be brought to see that they stand in need for Almighty God. Lord, we pray that souls all around us will consider what shall profit a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul. O oh Lord, we look to thee that thou will be pleased to minister to our congregation. These days we pray, Lord, that our whole minds will be fixed upon our blessed Lord. We pray for our children as they will not be Turning to school tomorrow, we pray that uh, you will be with them during this week. And we pray that as uh, they return in coming days to school, that you will watch over them in this year. And Lord, we look to thee that our children will know the rich blessing of God. And yes, we pray that they will know academic success. And yet, we pray much more for them that they will know that rich blessing of the Lord. We pray that as our Sunday school and children's meeting, our youth meetings recommence, that the Lord will be pleased to come and do a work in hearts this year. We pray to thee that we will see the salvation of our youth. And we pray to your Lord for our brother Quentin this week as he takes his leave office for these weeks. We pray, dear Lord, that I will go before him. We pray, Lord, in the midst of an ungodly atmosphere, that you'll preserve his heart and mind and watch over the family. Uh, 
back home. And Lord, we pray that even out of this time of difficulty and trial, that the Lord's rich blessing will be known. And so, Lord, we commend our time to thee this evening, come and minister to us. We pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in God's word, please, to the Psalm 127. On account of the lockdown arrangements, we're going to come straight to the message this evening. And so we'll leave the catechism until next Lord's Day in the will of the Lord. And if you came with an offering, if you just bring it to the bag after the, the meeting. Uh, I should just mention, in case I forget later, that there won't be the prayer meeting Wednesday evening, uh, so we won't be able to have the meeting here, but we'll have the meeting over Skype as we did uh, back last year during Lock time, lockdown, so if you're able to join for that Skype meeting, you can send me a text uh, so that I can join you into that particular call. So that will be on Wednesday at 7. Psalm 127, I have been looking at these Song of Degrees. In the first message, I suggested a link uh, between these Songs of Degrees and the reign of Hezekiah. And uh, we might ask the question, well, what would this psalm have to do with Hezekiah? There is here in this psalm the idea of readjustment of priorities. And if we think of Hezekiah being sick, that certainly, as he was told about um, putting his house in order and so on, there certainly was that sense of priority. And as he was God's mercy given 50 more, 50 more years. How is he going to use them? This psalm is instructive. To that end, he can learn from these words that are related to Solomon. And then there is another view concerning these psalms that is, uh, some view them as being associated with the feasts in Jerusalem. There will be sung as God's people made their way to Jerusalem. How does this psalm fit with that? Well, in going to Jerusalem for those feasts, surely it was a time of readjustment, uh, a time when God's people would adjust priorities, as often we do. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the year, we might reflect on things that are past. God's people were to do that at the feasts. This psalm would certainly fit in with that context. So psalm 127, a song of degrees for Solomon. Or in the margin, the song of degrees of Solomon. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man, or happy is the mighty man, that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. We'll end there, knowing the Lord will bless the reading of his word at hand, a reading in the bulletin from 2 Samuel. Uh, so we'll leave you to look at that later in your own time. Let's seek the Lord's face briefly again in prayer as we come to the message this evening. Our gracious Father, we pray, dear Lord, as we come for these moments around thy word, that the help of the Lord will be given. The Lord be pleased to take thy truth and to write it upon each one of our hearts. Give that mighty enjoyment of power from on high in our Lord's great name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Martin Lloyd-Jones said in a message at the beginning of 1950, the 20th century has proved the truth of the Bible in a way no previous century has ever done. Lloyd-Jones was making those comments in the context of speaking about man's desires last century, the early part of the last century, 
to enter into some type of utopian society. The idea that we uh, improve our education, we improve working conditions, we focus on raising health care, the standard of living, life will be perfect. What was the outcome? Two great world wars. Man failed in his desire. Hence, Lloyd-Jones concluded that the 20th century and that failure had proved the truth of the Bible in a way no previous century had ever done. If Lloyd-Jones was right in that, how much more true those thoughts are for our day? And what are our politicians grasping at? And they hope to be able to control the weather and through sustainability. That this will bring about a perfect climate. And they want to be able to control how we think. We must all think the same way. Dissent is no longer tolerated, it's too dangerous. And they want us to live in a world of no judgment, no discrimination, equality for all. Except, as Orwell pointed out, some will be more equal than others. How will this whole scheme of things that we are witnessing today, how will that fare in comparison with desires at the beginning of the last century? Well, the answer is still, the utopia will not come. And it will not be because enough people have not complied that whole scheme will result in utter failure. In fact, it will bring chaos. And surely we're witnessing much of that even around us at this time. Because God is not in it. Since God's not in any of it, it will be complete failure. And the psalmist here is describing in Psalm 127 the necessity of dependence upon the Lord. And that's certainly what our nation and many nations like it lack at this time. There is no sense of our need to be dependent upon the Lord. Whether it's in the nation, whether it's in the church, or whether it's in the family, this psalm is emphasizing to us we must have our dependence upon the Lord. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And this word house is used in all three of those ways that I have described in Scripture. It can be used to describe the nation. It can be used to describe the church. And of course it can be used to describe the family. Except the Lord build. They labor in vain. They build it. The psalm has the title, A Song of Degrees for Solomon, or in the margin, A Song of Degrees of Solomon. And you might wonder, well, why is it that the alternative is given? It is because the Hebrew is not absolutely clear. The Hebrew could be translated either way. And so there are two views then. Some believe that this was a psalm written most likely by David for Solomon, and that David was exhorting Solomon, telling him, you'll never do the work of building the temple, the house of God, without the Lord. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Now, others believe the, the margin is correct. This is a psalm that has actually been written by Solomon. We do know that Solomon wrote poems and uh, this then uh, it could be one of them. We have in this psalm the theme of vanity. They labor in vain that build it. The end verse 1, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early. And you'll know that that word vain, vanity, futility, emptiness, 
is associated with Solomon. I personally take the view that Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes in the latter part of his life. And he was looking back and he was giving advice to others that they would not make the mistakes that he had made. And he was warning of the vanity, the futility of a life lived without God. Perhaps then Solomon also wrote this psalm in the latter part of his life in association with the book of Ecclesiastes. In verse 1 we have this mention of the house, as I have suggested. It could be a reference to the temple that Solomon was to oversee the, the building of. In verse 2, at the end of the verse 2, it speaks of, So he giveth his beloved peace. If you remember back in the series that we had of David, in 2 Samuel 12, verse 25, Solomon was given another name, Jedidiah. Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. And it could be that Solomon here is saying that the Lord would give Solomon his beloved sleep. Now these Psalms, as I've been seeking to show you, are Christ centered. And so whether David is the writer here, or Solomon, or even someone else for Solomon. Ultimately, the psalm carries us to Christ. As one preacher put it, Christ is the singer of Psalm 127. Because remember, our Lord said, I will build my church. I will build my church. And Christ then could say, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. In 2 Samuel 7, we have there what's often referred to as the Davidic Covenant. In that chapter, the Lord is assuring David that there is one that will follow him, his seed, who will build the temple. And the first fulfillment of that was Solomon, David's son, building the physical temple in Jerusalem. And yet a careful reading of that chapter, 2 Samuel 7, shows us that that chapter does not stop with Solomon. As we read about the establishment of the kingdom, the building of a house that will endure, we are brought to see that Christ is in view. That the temple then that Solomon built, it points us to the house that Christ is building, his own church. He is building a kingdom. In verse 3 of Psalm 127, lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. In verse 5, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. And the verses 3 to 5 then are all about the family. Very often, a Christian father that has a large family, it will be said of him that he has his quiver full. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Now undoubtedly the Christian family is in view here in these verses 3 to 5. I'm not denying that. But ultimately this again carries us to Christ. Verse 5, happy is the man the man there is actually the same type of man in verse 4. Happy is the mighty man. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. The most blessed man. As we have in Psalm 1. The most blessed man is Jesus Christ. He has his quiver full of them in that he has been given this great company of children. And every one of those children ultimately will be seen to be in his quiver. I'm not going to take the time to turn to it this evening, but in Hebrews 2 verse 10, it says, It became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. What is Christ saying his work in? To bring these many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, or to use the language of Psalm 2, to 
to make the mighty man, to make the mighty man of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Then in Hebrews 2.13, uh, the writer here is quoting from the Psalms and saying that Christ will be a great, a great fulfillment of the words, Behold, I and the children which God has given me. Behold, I and the children of God which God hath given me. That great day when the church is presented in glory, Christ will say, Here am I, and the children thy has given me. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Christ then is at the heart of this psalm. But in the time that we have, and I want us to focus in on these words at the end of the verse 2. We'll read the whole of verse 2 from the context. It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. So he giveth his beloved sleep. The blessed man gives his beloved sleep. We have that, of course, in the gospel. Christ said, Come on to me, all ye that labor, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. There's this rest in the gospel. We are waiting to enter into our eternal rest. But the Lord also gives us literal physical rest. So he giveth his beloved sleep. I want us to think here this evening then of sleep for the Lord's beloved. First of all, there is sleep for the Lord's beloved in seeing Christ as the builder. So how does the Lord give us sleep? Well, here firstly, we can know sleep because Christ is the builder. We are to keep this in mind. The psalmist have said it's about priority and perspective. It's about aiming for balance in life. The psalm is calling for a balance between hard work and trusting God. And so the psalm is not arguing against hard work. The psalm is not arguing against labor. It is not advocating laziness. But it is arguing for greater trust and confidence in the Lord. If I work without looking to the Lord for His help and trusting the Lord for His help, that is self-sufficiency. I can get through. All my work will accomplish what is needed. Self-sufficiency. If on the other hand, I clear that I'm just trusting and I never do any work, that's presumption. And both are wrong. And all of us get it wrong somewhere. There are those of us who work hard work every moment that's given to us. And we fall into the trap of thinking that as long as we work hard, all will be well. And we can even fall into the trap of trying to do God's work that way. And so if we're busy, if we have lots of church programs, if the bulletin is full, lots of functions, then we presume that is how the Lord's work gets done. The Lord says no. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. We need the Lord. Remember in the book of Haggai, there was that lament there that they had so much but brought in little. Haggai 1.6 Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, uh, but there is none more. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. And uh, this is not the reality of life so often. And for those that have this very strong work ethic, and it's good to have a strong work ethic, as I said, that Samson is not speaking against that. But to have this idea that if I do all the work, that that is going to achieve. We can 
so much and yet harvest virtually nothing. Could earn all this money, but it just disappears through the holes in the wall. There are others that are at the other extreme. And they say, it's not about me. God provides. I don't need any planning. I don't need to think about working. The Lord will always look after me. And they may even again look at God's work in that way. I don't need to do evangelism. The Lord has his people. He will bring them in. We don't need to think about church finances. The Lord is always going to supply. And we use this pious argument. We may use or more accurately misuse our Calvinism. We have this idea, I have no responsibility. Just leave it all over to the Lord. Psalmist is showing us that both are wrong. So when the psalmist says here, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain and build it, he is not saying sack the builder. And when he says, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain, he is not saying sack the security. No, the builder is to keep building. But he is to do it in the Lord's name and looking for the Lord's help. The watchman is still to stay awake and watch from the city wall. But he is to realize that he needs the Lord's help in it. So the sound then is arguing for a work rest balance. We come then to verse 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to be the bread of sorrows. Yeah, there are those who would work every hour of the Lord again. And so they go to bed late because they've been busy. And they're up early because there's so much still to do. And their life revolves around them. That's all that life is to them. Work, work, work. And the question that has been uh, asked really in this psalm is this. What is it all for? Because your life is consumed with the work. And what do you have at the end? The bread of sorrows. It's directed us back to Genesis 3. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, we read there as a consequence of the fall as a consequence of sin, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. You work every moment to give it to you. You're just reaping the consequences of the fall. And we can do this. We can fall into this trap. Work, work, work. And we feel look for the Lord's blessing. You remember how the Lord sought to bring the type of correction we have in this psalm in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Bethany. Remember how the Lord came to visit. We read that Martha was cumbered about much serving. She was distracted by the serving. Now there was nothing wrong with her being busy in the kitchen there was nothing wrong in her wanting to provide a meal for the Lord. That was good. That was honorable. But she was completely consumed with it. But she forgot all about the blessing that it was to have the Lord there. No. And as Mary then, sorry, as Martha sought to rebuke Mary, our Lord said, Martha, Mary has chosen good part. We could do without the dinner. And Mary has recognized that. There's something more important than that meal. More important. 
court to sit at the Lord's feet and to hear what he has to say. You see, for Martha to have served that maidant, for it all to go well, that's all it was. It fits into this category of family. Vanity. And so in the psalm, there's a contrast here between the vanity in verses 1 and 2 and the happiness that's described in verses 3 to 5. Verse 5, happy is the man. When we're like Martha, we fail in the area of satisfaction. We lose all. Happy is the one that has his or her priorities readjusted. And this word build that we have in verse 1, except the Lord build the house. The same Hebrew word was used by Sarah. I mean, she was frustrated over the issue of not having a house. And of course, I'm not talking here about the bricks and mortar, but not having a child. Sarah said unto Abram, this is Genesis 16, 2. Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And those words, obtain children by her, are actually this word, build. Go into the servant. Build a house through her. I haven't been able to build the house. Of course, Sarah was still wrong. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain to build it. And that desire of Sarah, while the desire to have a house was good. As she desired, she tried to do it without the Lord and would be in vain. It would only add to her sorrow. But when the Lord came and did it in His time and His way, it certainly was not in vain. The Lord gave Sarah laughter. The vanity, she was delivered from it. And she was brought into this happiness, into blessing. So we are to see that all our labor is the Lord's work. Whether that's in our own homes, making the dinner or cleaning the floor. Whether it's our labor in the workplace, or whether it actually is our labor in the house of God or something associated with the house of God, it's all the Lord's work. And it is all to be done unto His honor and glory. And it is all to be done with this awareness. I need the Lord to be in it. I dare not even do this. I dare not even brush the floor as it were without the Lord's blessing being upon it. So our work in the congregation must be soaked in prayer. Our labor with our children, our labor in our homes, it must be soaked in prayer. We can spend time talking to our children and we ought to. Perhaps we would profit a lot more if we would spend more time talking to the Lord first. Our labor's in the workplace. We need to commit it to the Lord in prayer. Surely at the end of the working week we'll be more satisfied if we've done it all to the Lord and known the Lord was with us than if we merely do it to please a boss. There's sleep for the Lord's beloved in seeing Christ as the builder. I want to say secondly, there's sleep for the Lord's beloved in seeing Christ as the guardian. Verse 1, except the Lord build the house, the labor in vain build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And so the illustration here is of the watchman in an ancient city, a walled city, and he's looking out for the approach of the enemy. And here, as 
think of it in the words that follow, so he giveth his beloved sleep. As we tie this together, really what the psalmist is saying is, you can lie down and sleep. Not just because the watchman is there, but because the Lord is keeping you. In fact, that's the, the word here that is used for the watchman. The watchman is very literally a keeper. It's the same word used back in Psalm 121. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Slumber nor sleep. And so if you can go and lie down, not just because the watchman is there, not just because that keeper is there. Because the Lord is watching over his own. He is our guardian. And so often we lose out in sleep because of anxiety. And that anxiety is often because of misplaced priorities. Remember how the Lord talked about that in Matthew chapter 6. Don't be overly anxious about what you're going to wear. Don't be overly anxious about what you're going to eat. Don't lie awake at night being full of worries about those things because they're all secondary. We, we want something that's durable, and so we build. And yet we're actually focused on things that don't endure. Man wants security, this watchman. And he watches, but his concentration is in the wrong place. We need to see Christ is our guardian. He watches over us. Therefore, we can put our heads down and sleep. Then thirdly, there is sleep for the Lord's beloved in seeing Christ as the warrior. Uh, I use that word warrior for the man in verses 4 and 5 is mighty man. So the particular Hebrew word that's used here is describing a mighty man. And so in verse 3 we have this mention that children are the heritage, are the heritage of Lord. As we keep this in the context of the, the verse 2, this rising up early, sitting up late, I believe the idea is that so many invest all of their energy into leaving an inheritance. I want to work hard so I can set up my children, so that I can have this great legacy for my children. And sounds to say, hold on. Your children are the inheritance. And so it's not so much about investing for them as investing in them. You could leave a huge bank account for your children, yet it won't be for their good because you haven't invested in them. I think the psalmist is addressing another area here in home life. It's one that we very often see today where children are regarded as a hindrance. Children are in the way of my progress. The psalmist says, no. They're the inheritance. They're the greatest investment. And so if you look with me in verse 5, Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now as we keep those words in verse 5 just for the moment at a human level only, the idea is that children will in time come to their parents' defense. This is the idea of speaking with the enemies in the gate. And so the gate was the place where business was done. And so in days to come, when this man is now a mighty man, and as I emphasize, keeping it just at the human level here, as the father may have been that mighty man, in his latter years, he knows weakness. Because he is invested in his family, they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. They come 
and they speak on his behalf. They're the advocates. The words there can also have the idea of the margin show they actually subdue the enemies. They can overcome the enemies. Now, what's happened in our society? Parents have forsaken their responsibility to their children. They see their children as a bit of a, a hindrance. And so they give all the rearing of the children over to others. I'm going to focus on working. Both parents focus on working to bring in as much as possible for the household. And what's the result? That when the parents come to old age, the grown children now treat their parents as the parents treated them. I don't know about you, but during the whole euthanasia debate in our state, I was horrified as I heard what many spoke about their parents in various phone ins. If I had the opportunity, this is what I would do. But it all started. My parents had treated their children. And the Sam is saying, we need to get back. Do not see children as a hindrance, but as a blessing. How he is, man. We come in closing then to see, again, as I've suggested, that this man in verse 5 is Christ. How he is the man that hath his quiver full of them. The Lord has invested everything. He has given his life for us. Right now in glory, he intercedes for us. He is fixated, as it were, with his people, with his children. And we then are these arrows, as it were, in the quiver. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The Lord has us here on earth to speak up, to not be afraid to stand for Christ. Through the onward march of the church, the enemies will be driven back. At the very beginning, I mentioned those words of Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And many, when they think about those words, they take encouragement from them. But they have the idea that those words are promising the church just manages to hold her own. The enemy's always pushing against us, but in the gates of hell, or in the words of Psalm 127, the enemies of the gate, they're not able to prevail. The church manages to survive. But the Lord wasn't just saying that. The Lord was actually saying church is going to be in the onward march and the gates of hell will not be able to restrain it. The church is pushing forward and the enemies cannot prevent it. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. They shall subdue. There'll be this onward march. You say to me, but the work of God in Australia is what not even best of the work of God in this house does not look like that. It doesn't look like we're in the onward march and hell can't stop us. Why is that? Because we haven't learned verse 1 yet. Except the Lord built the house. They labor in vain and then build Lord, help us to press on in his work, keeping our focus upon our blessed Lord, upon all that he has done in our life. May the Lord be pleased to pour out his mighty blessing. We'll bow together these prayers for the second. Our gracious Father, we thank you for thy precious truth this evening. Pray, dear Lord, that you will take your word. Seated to all our hearts, 
Lord, we do pray even over this congregation, except the Lord build the house, they may be able to build it. We pray then, dear Lord, that we will labor, looking for and knowing the blessing of the Lord to rest upon us. We pray that you will part us in your blessing, and with your favor abide upon us. 